Why? We uh, are a day late this week, but it's for good reason. It was Dan's birthday yesterday. Happy birthday, Dan. If you're not familiar, I'm Evan Bierman. This is Dan Sloak. You're listening to the Domestic Draft Podcast. Today on the show, we're going to be talking about the Super Bowl that's just around the corner. The NBA trade deadline is also looming, but we have a special guest that's going to be joining us later to talk some Cubs and specifically the Iowa Cubs. And we're going to cover all those things today. Dan, like I said, it was your birthday. How was it? Where did you go? And uh, what are you drinking? Thanks, man. Birthday was great. Um, we went out to eat in Gaslamp. So if you're familiar with San Diego, Gaslamp is right next to the ballpark kind of there for the Padres. And it's, uh, you know, a lot of like clubby, nice restaurants. Um, so it's where a lot of people like to go out in San Diego. We went to this place called The Huntress. It was very, very good. Did a little surf and turf, had some uh, sea bass and some some steak. Uh, definitely treated ourselves to a nice dinner. Um, yeah, it was really good. Yeah, and what am I should. drinking? Yeah. Thanks, man. Appreciate that. <laughs> I have a uh, fall brewing. It's, it's one of my favorite beers here. I brought you a gift from them a few years back, a hat. Uh, it's just a really cool brewery. They've opened up since uh, a second tasting room. Their original location was in an old garage, mechanic garage in North Park. I've talked about them before. Um, and they have like this kind of punk rock kind of vibe in there with the garage doors opened up. They'll get a food truck because they don't have a kitchen. So like they'll rotate food trucks. Just opened up a second location down in South Park. So North Park and South Park. Um, they are closely related as well, if you don't know San Diego. Uh, but a little bit about the beer. It's called Goo Goo Muck Hazy IPA. It's a 3.8 on untapped, 6.4 ABV. It's a, a hazy IPA. So it's got some notes of pine in there. It's a citrus uh, hopped with Citra, Sentinental, Crystal, and Simcoe hops. Uh, and a little bit about uh, fall again is that they're uh, co-owner opening, uh, original owner has since been kind of ousted by two new, uh, owners, which is a graphic designer to the stars, uh, David lively and a premier stainless systems founder, Robert Soltis. We've talked about that before the premier stainless, he created like uh, brewing, uh, equipment and kind of had a brewery and then patented the brewing equipment. So he's got that business as well, doing really well for himself. I'm going to assume they're going to keep expanding because they make good beer, good vibes, North Park, South Park. We'll see where they go next. What about you? Wow. Um, I'm doing Goldfinger Brewing Company. They are based out of Downers Grove, Illinois. And actually, the name comes from uh, 19th century in Krakow, Poland. I'm not sure if I said that right. I believe I did. Marcus Goldfinger started a brewery and brewing equipment manufacturing company. So kind of ties in there with what you were saying. Lasted several decades. Today, a descendant of the Goldfingers, brewer Thomas Beckman, is dedicated to brewing lager beers with the utmost attention to technique and detail. He received his master brewer's diploma from the World Brewing Academy in Chicago and Munich, Germany. Thomas has honed his lager brewing skills to provide beer that is approachable, flavorful, enjoyable, and consistent. It's a primarily lager-focused brewery, so they do some pilsners, they do some Love lagers, that. a couple porters in there, but it's mostly lager beers. This one is their original lager. It's their flagship beer. It gets a 4.02 on a tap, which is a great score for a lager. And it's a 5.2%. But I thought this write-up from Goldfinger summed this beer up pretty well. Whether you're celebrating a victory of your favorite sports team or throwing back a couple with friends or coworkers, this beer is unobtrusive. It's the cold, crisp, light, yet flavorful accompaniment to life. So uh, I also thought that was a great description for our next guest. It is <laughs> Alex Cohen. He's the radio TV play-by-play -play broadcaster and the voice of the Iowa Cubs. You can find him on Twitter at Voice of Cohen. Alex, thanks so much for joining us. Not, thanks for having me. What a transition. That's pretty tough to beat right there. Yeah, I like that. That's professional stuff. Yeah, that yeah. was good, man. That was awesome. I appreciate <laughs> yeah. that. That might be the nicest thing somebody's ever said to me. So. All right, let's keep the ball rolling right. then. Was baseball yeah. broadcasting always the kind of goal for you? Is this always what you wanted to do growing up? Yeah, I mean, I think broadcasting in general. So uh grew up in Philadelphia, uh, dire Philadelphia sports fan, and uh, went to a high school called Upper Dublin High School, which is about 25 minutes north uh, of Philadelphia. And my friends and I actually started the sports broadcasting club at our high school. So uh, needless to say, we wanted to do that uh, since we were you know, 15, 16 years old. And I actually broadcasted every sport aside from baseball because I played baseball in high school. So nice. football, basketball, hockey, lacrosse, field hockey, swimming. Um, I think the first game I ever broadcasted was a powder puff game my sophomore year. <laughs> so really, really setting the bar high on that. But uh, then I went to college at Indiana University and realized that yeah, I wasn't going to play baseball. Uh, you know, that's what happens when you throw an 83 mile per hour flat fastball. Better have a a future broadcasting it. So yeah. if I'm not going to play it, I might as well talk about it. So uh, 83 ain't bad though. 
I mean, 83 and flat isn't great. No, uh, no. But yeah, so I, I started broadcasting in college uh, baseball, you know, did student radio at WIOX in Indiana. And then uh, I started interning in minor league baseball. So interned for the Lehigh Valley Iron Pigs, which is 35 minutes away from where I grew up for two summers. Uh, and then I kind of started from the bottom up. Worked in uh, indie ball for a year for the Gateway Grizzlies, Frontier League just outside of St. Louis. Uh, then sent my application and demo to about 200 minor league baseball teams. Got one job offer with the Huntsville Stars. Uh, nice. That double A affiliate for the Brewers. I uh, was their broadcaster for two years. They then got bought. Uh, I was out of a broadcasting job in 2014. So I went to work for the Oakland Athletics as a media relation and broadcasting intern, which I think really helped me. I mean, I was 25 years old at the time, and you know, I got to sit in the booth every single home game with Vince Catronio and Ken Korak, the, the play-by-play broadcasters for the Oakland A's. I just learned, you know, I just kind of sat back and, and realized what they were doing and what I wasn't doing and trying to combine them. And yeah, it was that summer where I, I realized that I missed having a microphone in front of my face too much. So uh, I went to Australia right after that, uh, called games, the Australian baseball league for the Melbourne aces uh, in 2014, came back in 2015, uh, spent that summer with the Idaho falls chuckers rookie league affiliate of the Kansas City Royals <laughs> at the time in Idaho falls, Idaho. Uh, then two years with the Bowling Green Hot Rods, single A affiliate for the Tampa Bay Rays, and the last six with the uh, Iowa Cubs. So it's been a non-linear twelve-year path. Love it. What a grind, love hearing man. those minor league team names too. It's oh, always the so Chuckers. Chuckers. Chuckers is my favorite. Hot Rods, <laughs> and yeah, no, it's been fun. My dog's about to come in here right now, so he's gonna say hi, hi, Jax. What's oh, up? Oh, nice. Hey. Yeah. So, wow. uh, but yeah, no, it's just been you know twelve years and three levels and a bunch of countries and states and bus rides and um everything put it in the work man yeah no it's been um i think once i'm done broadcasting baseball i, I would say i'd write a book but i hate writing so we'll, we'll go with an audio book go with go. The audiobook. there you go um so let's take it back to when you were at, at iu um mm -hmm. were you calling baseball games there and if so was there like a big name i know we know you know kyle schwarber is the biggest iu name um, yeah so was he there when you were there or was, was that a freshman when i was a senior uh, okay. so I actually called one game of his against Minnesota. Uh, but yeah, I called games for WIUX and did a couple on the, uh, IU Hoosier stream. And at that point, uh, there was a couple of like supplemental first round draft picks. Matt Bayshore was a left-handed pitcher for the twins. Um, he was a guy who really stuck out. He was, you know, first team all big 10 for three years. So, um, he's a guy who I remember, but just, you know, being able to call games in the big 10 at, at you know, St. Bauer field and, it was a it was a nice start to, to broadcasting baseball and kind of understanding what it's like to call high level baseball. So probably cool. did like 15, 16 games in four years, started my freshman year, didn't call games my junior year because I was studying abroad. But, you know, the five or six games I did my senior year was like, wow, like I want to do this 150 times a year. I know he was only a freshman, but you said Schwarber was there. Could Did he have the factor where you're like, yeah, that's a pro ball player or not? It, it was more during batting practice where you see this like pretty left-handed swing hitting a ball yeah. 470 feet in March, <laughs> where it's just like, all right, well, this is something I haven't seen in four years. So that's a little bit different. Um, but it was, I just remember the swing and the sound off the bat, even during BP, where it's just like, holy crap, this is... Yeah. Just a little, a little different. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Um, we grew up Cubs fans. Uh, we're both from uh, the area. So we grew up listening to Pat Hughes. Uh, by by way of working for the Iowa Cubs, you're kind of a co-worker uh, of Pat Hughes, and he's a recent Hall of Famer. What's it like to have somebody like that kind of uh, to, to look up to and be a part of the organization with you? He is the best, and that's not hyperbole. I mean, there's a reason why he's a Hall of Famer. You listen to a game, you close your eyes, you know exactly what's going on, exactly what the weather's like, exactly what direction the wind is blowing, what uniforms the guys are wearing, what the score is, what the situation is. And it's just broadcasting 101 and the fact that he's been able to do it at this level for so long. And there's been no diminishing of skills or passion or tempo. I mean, he's the standard. And when you're calling games for the Chicago Cubs and anywhere in their organization, whether it's in a ball or in the big leagues, you want to be able to uphold that standard. It's really important. So uh, Pat just is a you know leader by example. Um, and I, I've fortunately been able to talk to him a couple of times and he is as nice and genuine of as a man as he is as good as a broadcaster. So, I mean, everything matches up with Pat. He's tremendous. Love it. That's good to hear. And that's, that's about what I expected too. So I'm right. glad you said yeah. that. Um, now we told you before the show, Dan and I met 
in uh, Iowa, actually in Dubuque. We both went to school right. there. Um, unfortunately, never made it to an Iowa Cubs game, uh, even to this day. Um, but we do hear a lot about the environment in Des Moines and how that city really rallies around the Iowa Cubs. So yep. could you just take take us through what it's like going to a Cubs game in Des Moines and, and you know, how people really show out? Yeah, I mean, when, when you're you know, a representative of a minor league team, same team, same stadium for 40 years, yeah. especially when you're three turns away from Wrigley Field on high, on high I-80. Yeah, they call it the I-80 shuffle for a reason. I mean, it's um, it's Cubs fever here. It, it really is. And you know, I've been fortunate enough to be able to go to a lot of minor league baseball stadiums and see a lot of minor league baseball environments. And, and again, I might be biased, but I, I truly believe there is no minor league baseball environment like a Friday, July game, 80 degrees at Principal Park. Um, you know, 2000, <laughs> July 4th, 2019, 13,300 fans at Principal Park. I mean, it was the hair still sticks up on my arms. It's like, it's kind of like what minor league baseball is supposed to be like. And, and in Iowa is really the only feeling where I have, it's like, all right, this is why minor league baseball exists for the community, for the fans and just the atmosphere of game. Man, how can you not be romantic about baseball, right? That's this is my that's, job to try to explain it to you. That's me. the line right there, man. So you yeah. kind of answered my next question was going to be, you've traveled, you've done so much coverage of minor league ball clubs. Yeah. Uh, it was a favorite stadium or do you have a, a fan base or a team that you would just really enjoy following? Yeah. I mean, from, from a minor league baseball standpoint, I really like Nashville. I just love the city. The, the ballpark is situated on the south side of town and where the broadcast booth is situated. You have the, the guitar scoreboard in right center field and right above it is the skyline. So that's really cool. And, and just being able to walk to, to Broadway and all the restaurants and uh, their right field areas like this big bar area called the band box. And they have bags and pop a shot and mini golf. I mean, it's like a party. It just yeah, it sounds like Nashville. Oh, it's fun. <laughs> Um, so a Friday night there is, is rowdy. Um, and, and then just in general, I mean, I've been able to broadcast games internationally, uh, for the world baseball softball confederation since 2015. So in 2019, I was able to call the gold medal premier 12 game at the Tokyo dome, uh, Dang. Japan against Korea and 45,000 fans standing up for three and a half hours, not drinking an ounce of alcohol in the ballpark, you know, 45 minutes before the game. I'm doing an on-air hit. You know, I walk out of the dugout. It's 45 minutes before the game, and everybody's there. And I'm looking at the guy I'm calling the game with, J.P. Morosi. They're counting down 10, 9, 8. I look at him. I'm like, I'm going to pass out. (laughs) (laughs) Carry me up. He's like, just take a deep breath. And I just – it was an out-of-body experience just being able to call a game there and and witness a baseball game with Japan and with their rival Korea. It's – Tokyo Dome is probably the coolest place I've been able to call a game and see baseball. That's great. That is a, that is a hell of a story. Yeah. Um, now you do the, the pregame, the postgame interviews and the in-game interviews. And I'm most curious about the in-game interviews and how that differs from, you know, doing a pregame or a postgame interview. Are you just tossing softball questions up because they're trying to do something at the same time? Or, I mean, is there a different approach that you take to all three of those? Yeah. I, I think during the game, it's short and sweet. Uh, you don't want to, have the the world's long, longest question for an in-game interview in the fourth <laughs> inning when it's a 4-2 game and you know there's runners at first and third and two outs but mm-hmm. you know I, I really take the pre-game interviews and try to tell a different story I mean anybody can go on the back of a baseball card and see that Caleb Killian you know got drafted by the San Francisco Giants and he went to Texas Tech and he grew up in Texas and he's from California but you want to ask the questions about the family what got him into baseball uh what was his favorite baseball moment who was his favorite player yeah, you know, it's my job to during those pregame interviews is try to describe those players and have them described as people and not just baseball players. So I try to take my pregame interview a little bit more personal, um, not just looking at Google and saying, oh, you're from here. You know, you play baseball here. You know, your teammates have been here. Just try a little bit something different. I love that. Yeah. The human aspect of the game. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm curious about post game. Um, and I'm curious of ever walking in maybe after a bad loss or, or a bad outing by the team. And there's just a blow up going on and you as media is walking in and you're kind of on like pins and needles of like, I don't know if I'm going to ask yeah. a lot of questions. I mean, today. We'll, we'll, we'll close the door sometimes, but you know, when you've been working in baseball for a long time and especially, you know, fortunately for me, I've been working for the Iowa cup since 2018 
with the coaching staff, I mean, we have returning guys that I know that if, you know, let's say you lose 16 to one, that's not going to be a happy clubhouse. I have that one guy I could talk to him, like, just, just give me two or three standard quotes, say today didn't go well. This is what didn't go well. This is what we can do better tomorrow. Just having your, your guys that, that, you know, that the, the losses and just the, the emotion of the game won't impact them in a situation like that so yes can, i've gone to the locker room where yeah. where it's been tough and i've been on a bus ride where you've lost six straight and you're busing eight hours through the night you know from indianapolis to iowa and there's nobody who wants to talk you just got to find that one that one guy those two people that that are pros that are just like you know what i know you have to do this it's your job and i'm going to give you what you want but that's it I like that. I, you kind of had like the behind the scenes curtain. I'm, I'm I'm curious if you see like a national story and you see a quote, you're like, yep, that was kind of already prefabricated, pre-made. And I see right there. Yeah, that, that was like, I'm going to give you what you what you need for 10 seconds and then you have to go away. So. Yeah. <laughs> what are some of the like biggest names you've uh, had the opportunity to broadcast? You said you've been with the Iowa Cubs since 2018. Yeah. What's the, the biggest player that you'd say at this point that you've gotten a chance to to speak with on the day-to-day? Uh, well, you know, after a game or something, it's it's interesting. Um, in 2018, uh, we had Chris Bryant rehab for three days, and and it was it was 2018, and we were, if not the worst team in minor league baseball, one of the worst teams, and we were 30 games under 500. Mm-hmm. And Chris Bryant comes to rehab with us in August on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We had like 30,000 people combined at Principal Park. It was like our largest Monday crowds we've ever had. And people wow. were waiting outside for like three hours beforehand. And, you know, KB signed every single autograph for fans and staff members. I mean, he was he was awesome. Uh, 2019, Craig Kimbrell was with us for a week right after he got signed by the Cubs. Remember, he didn't have spring training at that point. Um, so he basically had a, a, a shortened spring training with us. He was on a road trip in Sacramento. And then he came back and played with us for five days. Uh, he was, you know, a larger than life kind of guy there. I mean, Craig Kimbrough is going to be a, a Hall of Fame reliever when it's all said and done. Mm-hmm. And he signed autographs for, I kid you not, 45 minutes before the game. I mean, he was the first one out signing autographs. He was the last person in signing autographs. So um, I thought that was really cool. And, and then Wilson Contreras, he rehabbed with us in 2019 when we won the division title. And, you know, Wilson being part of the celebration was just really cool. Like he was holding the locker room door open and giving every single person a high five. And, you know, he was a he was the biggest smile there for a player who was just there for major league rehab. So I thought that was neat. And, and then Ian Happ started with us in 2019. Remember, you know, began the season up in the big leagues in 2018. He hit that home run on the second pitch of Major League Baseball action, struggled at the back end of 2018, struggled in spring training in 2019, and then shockingly didn't break camp with the Cubs. He wasn't with us for just a couple of days. He was with us for three months right. in 2019, just you know, getting away from the pressures of Chicago, playing every day, figuring out his swing and you know, Ian had every reason just to not be happy there and not be affable, not talk to the media, not be good with player relations. Um, if I were in his spot, I probably would have been part of my language of pain in the ass. And yeah. he was not. Um, you could tell he didn't want to be there, but he worked his butt off. He was always in there early and he was nothing but respectful. I mean, he was really just the consummate professional at a time like that where he didn't have to be. And I'm surprised that he was, but I, I couldn't have been more impressed with Ian Happ that season. I kind of want to circle. Oh, go ahead, go yeah, ahead. 100% paid off. I mean, Ian Happ's one of the faces of the franchise, I would feel like, at this point, right? He's just, he is, and, and he's a guy who was a first-round draft pick, and he's an all-star last year. He would have been an all-star in 2020 if they had all-stars in the COVID-shortened season. And yeah, remember, he was a guy who was drafted as a switch-hitting second baseman, and yep. now he's a gold-glove outfielder. Like, the amount of work that he's put in and, and adaptation he's had to his game and how he's profiled as a big leaguer, as I said, I couldn't be more impressed. Yeah, we're big fans. We we did the connect roasters as well, and uh, some Don nice. there. So we got some sort of a way to to connect there. I, I want to circle back to what you said, and it really kind of just stood with me in that response was the pressures of Chicago. And I'm yeah. curious, as a broadcaster out in Iowa, if you if you observe that a lot, or if the players talk about it, if they come back and they're like, oh, it's you kind of get your mind right. It's Iowa. Field of Dreams was filmed in Iowa. It's kind of that romantic kind of place for baseball it's in its purest form did, did the players kind of feel that or is that a, a known thing that there's a lot of pressure for a Cubs player 
Yeah, I, I think it was more in 2018, 2019, and even the first half of 2021 when they were competitive and you still felt the edge of the 2016 World Series, mm-hmm. that guys, when they were here, they're like, crap, like I'm really close to being able to have to contribute into a pennant race for a team that's recently won a World Series. And when they come back, they're like, man, like that Wrigley Field atmosphere, that's something else. Yeah, like even Caleb Killian this past year, uh, his second star, or I think his first star was Cubs Cardinals at Wrigley Field. And when he came back, I asked him, like, what was that? Like, he was just like, his eyes got open. He's like, dude. Yeah. Like, yeah. No, right. like I've never experienced before. And this was a team with the Cubs that had no real expectations in 2022, but still, you know, Cubs Cardinals at Wrigley Field. It doesn't matter if the teams are 0 161. Like, if that's game 162, game 62, it matters. Like, Love baseball it. at Wrigley Field, Cubs Cardinals, or really Cubs anybody. It matters. And I think it, it, that's a palpable feeling among the players. I know I'm still high on Caleb Killian. I don't know about you, Dan, but yeah. I saw some things last year. I feel like he's going to come up this year and he's going to be We're excited fantastic. For um, yeah. I mean, you know, sticking on that topic, anyone that was in Iowa last year that you think breaks with the big league club or maybe is up the first couple of weeks of the season here. I know the big name right now, it seems like is Matt Mervis. Um, he was so Brennan, much he, Mash yeah. Mervis. Uh, he he Mash was. Mervis everything about it lived up to the hype. So Matt Mervis actually made his Iowa Cubs debut in 2021. Uh, we had some injuries. The The single A and double A season ended before the, the triple A season. So we we just needed a couple players. And Mervis just taking BP in 2021 when he was a 220 hitter in A ball. The sound was a little bit different. The swing plane was a little bit different. And then fast forward a year. I mean, he was hitting 98 mile per hour fastballs off a of lefty 450 feet. Um, he's confident. He's a smart player. He's somebody who's willing to make adjustments and willing to put in the work. And Matt Mervis, when he's locked in is unlike hitters I've seen just at the triple a level or really any level. You you felt that the baseball was coming in like a beach ball. So wet weather whole break with the big league club. I mean, fortunately for the Cubs, they've made a lot of roster moves uh, between Cody Bellinger, you know, playing the outfield and first base Trey Mm -hmm. Mancini playing the outfield and first base where if you want Matt Mervis to break with the big league club, you you have the ability to put him as a DH, but if you don't, he gets the consistent at bats in triple a, it's in a really good situation. Uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing Brennan uh, healthy, you know, Brennan Davis in his first two triple a at bats in 2021, he had two home runs. He had mm-hmm. three home runs in his first three triple a games. That's a month after the futures game MVP as a 21 year old. And he's a year and a half away removed from that. He's a special talent. He's a special person. You, you just hope that he can get healthy and feel confident. I, I'm looking forward to seeing what he does during spring training. Uh, there's two names out of the bullpen that I really like. Uh, ben Leeper, uh, in 2020, he was a non-drafted free agent in the shortened draft. All he's done with the Cubs organization is produce. I mean, if you look at the career ERA in the minor leagues, it's under two. He's not a big guy, but you know, fastball 94 to 96, power slider. I mean, he's a guy that I don't know if he's going to make 72 relief appearances in a year, but in stints, 30, 40 times spaced out between three days, I think he's got big league stuff. And then Danny's Correa is a reliever who's 5'11", throws four pitches. His first fastball at the AAA level was 101 miles per hour. Mm. And I'm talking like 5'5", five, five, one, it's to be 5'11", five, five, 170. Okay. And it's just his arm looks like a hologram. It's crazy the way the ball jumps out of his arm. And he throws four pitches. He's got a nice changeup, good hook. Um, I, I think he needs a little bit more seasoning, but just like pure stuff. Uh, Danny's Correa, for how big he is and his stature, it, it's unlike anything that I've seen. So Correa and Leaper are the two relievers that I think in terms of pure stuff can make it to the big leagues. A- a- and then Mervis and Brennan, I would love for them to make their big league debuts this year. And I think they'll happen. Man. Nice. That 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 talk right there is just getting me ready for like you know spring, you, Evan and I would go to spring training every single year. We're, we're like diehard Cubs fans. Like you're getting us ready for the season, and it's a kind of an upturn, right? Like you've talked about it. You were kind of there when our farm system was depleted. You're saying thirty season or thirty games under, uh, and now we're kind of back, right? We got kind of one of the top tier farm systems in the league. There's a name though that has been around for a while with Cubs fans, and we thought this was going to be somebody who's been up in the majors, but he's yet to go. Uh, do you do you have an idea of who I'm talking about? Uh, Braylon Marquez. No, I was gonna do Miguel Amaya. Okay. 
What is going on there? I know he's had some health issues as well, but like Cubs fans are like, oh, once Contreras is gone, he's going to step in and just fill right in and be our future catcher. Yeah, I mean, I think that having Tommy John surgery definitely uh, derailed that a little bit. Uh, Then he had an injury midseason. What I really like to see from Amaya was when he was playing with Tennessee last year, his swing looked pretty. It was smooth. It was fluid. His at-bats were better. Wasn't striking out a lot, making a lot of contact, drawing walks. And it wasn't just swinging for the fences. It was, you know, hitting the ball the opposite way, spraying a double to right center. Uh, I've looked at some film of just the pure swing. It looked good. Uh, just him getting healthy. Yeah, I, I want to see Miguel Amaya put together a 100, 110 game season where, you know, maybe he'll catch 70 or 80 times. Maybe he'll mm-hmm. DH 20 or 30 dot times and the occasional game at first base. But in terms of a pure hitting tool, He's there. So just getting him on the field and getting him consistent ABs, I think he's a big league hitter. Love to hear it. I don't know how much you you follow the, you know, the players that are in the lower levels of the system, but Pete Crow Armstrong is somebody that's rocketing, it seems like, up the rankings everywhere and is conceivably one of our best um, prospects at this point. Is that somebody that you've watched and a lot of? I mean, how much have you heard about him? Heard a lot, watched a lot. I mean, he's a human highlight reel. I mean, the defense already plays at a big league level. I mean, it's almost like watching Griffey in center field. The gaps, diving catches, leaping catches. I mean, ever since he got drafted, he's profiled as a gold glove caliber defensive outfielder. The question is, would the bat play? And you looked at South Bend last year, Myrtle Beach last year. He's got the raw power. If he hits the ball to the corners, you're looking extra bases, second or third. He can draw walks. He can steal bags. I mean, he's just a ball of energy. And is he going to hit 30 to 35 home runs? I'm not sure. But, I mean, I think right now you're looking at offensively. He can profile as a 285, 290 hitter, 360 on base percentage with 20 to 30 steals. You get him up to 20 home runs. He's the type of guy who might hit 12 triples in a season just with his speed and, and mere athleticism. I've been really impressed from what I've seen. Remember, he's still young. I mean, he was among the youngest players in South Bend once he got up there, and he tore it up in the Midwest League. So really looking forward to seeing where he starts this year, whether it is in South Bend or if it's in Tennessee or even in Iowa. You know, getting that invite to big league spring training is a pretty big deal for him. So getting out there early in Arizona, getting those at-bats, being around the big leaguers, and you know, there's a reason why he's the number one prospect in the organization. I think it's deserved. Man, your wealth of knowledge with this, uh, you know, Chicago Cubs up and down the lineup here, uh, single A, double A, triple A, major league ball club. Let's, let's go there. Now you kind of talked about him getting the invite to spring training. We got a lot of new faces there right now. A lot of free agent signings in the off season. The biggest one being Dansby Swanson, uh, all the way down to, you know, Brad Boxberger. Do you got a, a favorite signing from the off season, uh, that somebody is going to kind of really kind of blend right into the cl- cubby I'll, I'll blue? I'll tell you what, what the Cubs have been able to do up the middle with Dansby at short, Nico at second and Cody Bellinger in center. I don't know if you'll get a better up the middle tandem in, in, in the national league, let alone baseball. So you know, those three guys right there, and you combine that with Say and Ian Happ in the outfield, like that's five of the nine players right there, along with Trey Mancini. That's 66% of your lineup that's really good, and guys who can produce all-star caliber seasons. Uh, I really like Dansby. I mean, just with the volatility of the shortstop position, I mean, Carlos Correa's had like six contract offers since we've had started this conversation. Yeah, so It's wild. Um, just to have somebody so steady – um, he's durable. I mean, if you look at his games played over the last two years, I mean, I think he's what at like 161 and 162. I mean, he's missed like three total games in the last two and a half years. So be able to have that every day, just such a a leader and a guy who can produce at one of the most important positions and most important spots in a lineup. I think that Dansby Swanson signing is going to be really important for the Cubs. I like the Bellager signing. He's an MVP caliber player. I mean, as of a year and a half ago, I I understand he's got a long left-handed swing and strikes out a little bit, but you know, Cody's been, you know, he's from Arizona, but he's been in in the facility and you can see that the swing looks a lot more smooth. And in terms of, pure talent to get a guy like that for a year, $20 million. When you have other outfielders waiting in the wings, it's a win-win. I mean, Cody could produce and make you a contender, but if he doesn't, you have Pico Armstrong, Brennan Davis, Alexander Canario, Owen Casey waiting in the wings. So it's, there's no risk involved in that. I only think it could help 
So I really like the Bellinger signing, and I think Dansby is going to be a focal point of the organization for a long time. Ah, let's do it. Love to let's hear do it. it. Let's Just do it. Me up. Yeah, yeah, right. Just hyping me up. All right. So you said before the show that you got a big weekend coming up this weekend, and you're a Philly fan. So I would assume that you're going to be decked to the nines in your Philadelphia Eagles gear, right? Yeah, yeah. The reason I'm not drinking uh, my favorite, yeah, uh, you know, my favorite beer. It's a nice light lager, Coors Light, sitting in my fridge. Coors um, lattes, I'm not, baby. I, 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 I'm not. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the rocks are. Uh, what are the rocks? <laughs> Mountains are blue. blue. Mountains uh, are blue. blue. Exactly. Um, no, I, I I'm actually going to the Super Bowl, so I'm I'm really uh, excited for That's that. That's incredible. Yeah, so uh, I'm heading down to Arizona on Saturday morning, going to the Waste Management Open on Saturday, going to the Super Bowl on Sunday, and hopefully celebrating on Monday. So, yeah, uh, what's your predictions for the game, man? I mean, I'm a little bit biased, but I, I think the Eagles are the best team in football. I, I try to go position by position, and obviously, you know the. The, the Chiefs have the, the advantage with quarterback. They have the advantage with tight end. Probably have better linebackers, better coach. They've been to the AFC Championship five years in a row. Been to the Super Bowl three out of those five years. But you look across the board, I mean, the Eagles have a better wide receiver room. They have a better offensive line. They have a better defensive line. They have a better defensive back. Uh, they're a little bit healthier. Um, yeah, I'm not going to give the coaching nod to the Eagles, even though they have the best offensive line coach in football and Jeff Stoutland. I mean, Andy Reid, that's a nice subplot, you know, going against the Eagles, where obviously he took the Eagles to a Super Bowl and right. first see championships. I just think the Eagles are a better team. I'll go with 27 21 Eagles, uh, and the under hits. So, yeah, if you're okay. a big betting guy, take the under and Eagles money line. So, just broke All it right. down for us there. Yeah. Uh, was... Quick, quick question. You seem like you're a very knowledgeable guy. Uh, Bears are trying to model a little bit of what Eagles are doing. Uh, do you see any similarities there between franchises or the way it's set up, uh, specifically looking at like kind of the offensive game? Yeah, I mean, I think Justin Fields had a very similar first year to what Jalen Hurts had. It was a lot of running, completing less than sixty percent of his passes, but there were there were shades of, of brilliance and you know top five quarterback talent. I think just simplifying it for Justin Fields, uh, obviously the running talents there, I mean, at over a thousand yards rushing, but yeah, you know, being able to utilize his six, four frame, keep him healthy. And he's got a big arm. So I, I think in terms of skill set, he's got more than Jalen hurts because he's bigger, stronger, should be more durable. Uh, he's got more to his arsenal with the deep ball, more of a live arm. And I feel like I'm talking about him like a pitcher, not a quarterback. <laughs> but, um, I, I think the sky's the limit. For Justin the ball. Fields. Yeah. I mean, and, and also like it kind of helps having the number one overall pick or, or being able to trade assets away for guys who or teams who want quarterbacks. So mm -hmm. heck, if they want to trade down to pick four and get another first round draft pick and get, you know, Will Anderson from you know, that edge rusher from Alabama, there's a lot of different ways that you can, you know, maneuver that number one pick. And I think having that number one pick when you already have your quarterback of the future, that's a nice luxury. All right. One, one last question before we get you out of here. You mentioned before the show, you recently got married again. Congratulations on that. One thing I noticed was that you were on house hunters. Is this uh is this true? And what was, <laughs> exactly. what was that? Like? Yeah. I was uh Twitter's favorite uh, house hunters villain in March of 2021. You were a villain. So what, yeah, what it happened? Was, uh, that Explain. Episode was uh was called Long Distance Dilemma in Des Moines, and uh, my girlfriend at the time, now wife, was moving from San Francisco to Iowa during the pandemic, and uh, I was basically telling her to move to the suburbs, and we ultimately moved to the suburbs, and Twitter didn't like that we moved to the suburbs. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was uh, Long Distance Dilemma in Des Moines, season one ninety nine, episode there thirteen. There you go. I love it. Yeah. Right there, there it is. There it is. All right. We're going to yeah, check I would, that I would out. say that I was nominated for best supporting actor, but I got an Emmy. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks again, Alex, for joining us again. You can find him on Twitter at voice of Cohen. He's the radio TV play-by-play -play broadcaster and the voice of the, the Iowa Cubs. Sorry, excuse me, Alex. Thanks so much. That's for okay. I'll, us, I'll, I'll take that correction all the time. <laughs> yeah. Pretty soon. Pretty soon. We'll yeah. see you up at the big league club. Thanks for having thanks me. Thanks really so much. Yeah. Thanks. thanks for being here, man. All right. Thanks again to our guest, Alex Cohen. Again, you can find him on Twitter at Voice of Cohen. He's the voice of the Iowa Cubs. All right, Dan, the NBA trade deadline is looming. We mentioned it at the top of the show. I'm curious what your thoughts are on some of these potential trades. We had some breaking news um, at the start of the show. Actually, there was a trade. So what are you seeing out there? And uh, second part of that question is, do you think the Bulls are going to do anything? Because they haven't yet. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, let's first let's talk about what's happened. Uh, the biggest trade happened on Sunday uh, so far. One of the bigger trades, uh, Kyrie Irving uh, requested a trade, and I think it was like three or two days later he was traded from uh, the Brooklyn Nets uh, to the Dallas Mavericks. So uh, him and Luca is going to be an interesting scenario. I I think the idea there is to take a little bit of a load off Luca. I, I if you looked at him in the playoffs the last couple of seasons, he looks absolutely gassed in the playoffs, you know, game 7, game 6, it, the whole team's on his shoulders. So maybe this frees him up a little bit. Maybe it makes him a little bit more dangerous because not every single eye is on him. He could pass out to Kyrie who we know can create a shot. Uh, with the best of them. He's one of the best creators by himself with the ball. So we'll see how that whole thing works down there. Uh, it's an interesting two ball dominated yeah. players. It's an interesting combination to see. And, you know, kind of, I love that Cuban does it, man. Like that guy doesn't care. He'll be aggressive. He'll make moves. He understands that, you know, you might have a window two, three, he, two, three years here and there uh, and make the most of it. Uh, unlike our team, but we'll get to the Bulls in a minute. Uh, the other trade that just happened, like Evan alluded to right before we started recording, is that the Lakers made a big move. We knew the Lakers were going to make a move. We knew they weren't going to try to squander LeBron's years with them. Uh, some Bulls fans thought they might be coming after DeMar. Some of them thought they might be coming after Zach. Uh, but actually, they went ahead and got D'Angelo Russell, who they drafted uh, out of Ohio State. They drafted him. That was like the Julius Randle, D'Angelo Russell, Russell, Lonzo Ball years. Um, mm -hmm. So they got him back uh, after a couple of stints. He was in Brooklyn, uh, recently in Minnesota. Uh, so they get him back. Uh, and it was a three-team uh, three team trade uh, between the Jazz, the Lakers, and the Timberwolves. So um, the Jazz get a whole bunch of picks on this one. The Timberwolves go ahead uh, and get Mike Conley and some picks uh, back. The Jazz get Russell Westbrook and a lot of picks. And let me just tell you something that Adrian Wojnarowski tweeted about the Jazz about an hour ago. So the Jazz right now, as it stands, have 15 unprotected or lightly protected first round picks through 2029, 15 first, first round picks in the next six years. They have the young core, a recent all-star former bull marketing, right? Walker Kessler is a rookie this year. He's playing pretty well. And, you know, a few other players there and 60 million plus in cap. So that's Danny Ainge, who we know uh, kind of uh, rectified the Celtics as well. He's out there in Utah doing the same thing, stockpiling draft picks. This is kind of what he does. He gets a young core, like trades away a lot of players to get draft capital and then sees where, see where it goes. I mean, that's what Tatum and Jalen Brown are from that era. So if you're a Jazz fan, you're excited. If you're a Lakers fan, you're excited. Uh, you know, you got your kind of Are point. You? I mean, you got D'Angelo West or D'Angelo Russell, excuse me, is a good player. Um, he's better than Westbrook. Um, he's younger, he, he brings a little mm -hmm. more life into it. I don't think they're done either. I think the Lakers are gonna maybe maybe they will make a move. Maybe they will do a Demar or a Zach there. I think they're gonna make a, as many moves as they need to to have like a contender because right now they're on the outside looking in on the playing games. So I think they're going to make a lot of trades, um, but that's kind of all that's happened. There's been a couple minor trades, but those are the two big ones. I'm, so waiting. I wanna, I'm waiting. Yeah, I want to add something to this here. It says per TNT's Chris Haynes, the Jazz are expected to buy out Westbrook once the trade is completed. And he adds that the Chicago Bulls and Los Angeles Clippers could be interested in signing the nine-time All-Star. What do you think about Russell Westbrook and the Bulls? Go for it. I I mean, it doesn't matter. This this we're not winning anything, so might as well make it fun and entertaining. Uh, Lonzo's not going to play this year, so we need a starting point guard. Imagine Io off the bench. The team will be better. We might win a first round game. Westbrook might blow the team up, but I I think Westbrook's kind of at a state right now in his career. He can kind of reflect and see that he's getting bought out on a trade, to where he's like, shit. All right. Like, I'm not who I used to be. You know, I, I'm not a franchise player, but he's still, I mean, he's still a good, talented player that draws a lot of attention to him. That would make it easier on Zach and Demar if we went ahead and got him. So I think that'd be cool. I would be all for Westbrook on the Bulls. It would be a fun end of the season run. Sign him for the rest of the year. You're not attached to him at all. Why not? But it's not my ideal moves. Your ideal moves, you've said, have been to blow up the blow roster. Up. Yeah, blow it up. Aren't they I mean, not incentivized to do that because of the, the first round pick next year? Anyways, 
I'm not exactly sure how those numbers play out, but I think one thing that they should be incentivized to is to trade Vucevic, who is, uh, you know, contracts up at the end of this year. So I don't think they're going to resign him either. So why not see what you can get for him? Um, I, I don't like the idea of standing still. And you just saw last night they got blown out, not blown out, but, you know, double digit loss to the Memphis Grizzlies, who's a playoff team. There's a couple of fake wins in there before that where people were like, well, look, Drummond's playing well, all this camaraderie. They look like they like playing with each other, but it's just garbage. The team's not set up to win. It needs a big reset or a big injection of somebody, a big personality like Westbrook, who might come in and just like look at everybody on the team. Like, listen up, motherfuckers. Like, let's go play some hoop. Let's, let's play some hoops. Let's let's play some ball. Like, stop acting like you're, you, you know, you're too cool to get contact and get physical. Like, Westbrook's a physical player. He's a dog out there. No matter how, like, big he got, he was still a dog, still not afraid, not backing down from anyone. You know, DeMar's kind of like that, but he's quiet. And I think if you get Russell in there, he'll bark and see what this team's made of. All right. So I've got a fast back before we get you out of here. We've been talking Iowa Cubs uh, on the show today. And the Iowa Cubs actually started off as the Iowa Oaks of the AAA, uh, AAA affiliate, actually, of uh, the, it looks like the White Sox is who they started off as. Yeah. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. They started as athletics, but they later moved to be the affiliate of the White Sox until 1982. And that's when they became the Iowa Cubs for our Chicago Cubs. So a little interesting tidbit. They started off as the A's affiliate, moved to the Chicago White Sox as the Iowa Oaks. And now they're the Iowa Cubs. Man, whatever I think of, you're probably the same way. Minor league teams, you hear the name and just think of what does that hat look like? Because minor league baseball hats are the coolest hats out there. An Iowa Oaks hat, you could just imagine, is like a a just badass like tree, right? Right? Like a nice like tree on the front. What are the colors? What do we got? Brown and green. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little cursive oak right under the roots, spelled out in the roots of the tree kind of idea. Yeah, this would be some vintage stuff too, back uh, early. That'd be sweet. 70s, 60s, 70s too. Yeah, but uh, thanks again to our guest, Alex Cohen, for joining us today. That's been our show. For Dan Slug, I'm Evan Bierman. You've been listening to the Domestic Draft Podcast. If you're listening on Spotify, don't forget to rate the